Let's join together for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, thank you that on this day we are able to come together and worship together. And thank you for the beauty of the snow outside and for the safety and the travel of arriving here. Pray also for all those who weren't able to make it this morning. Pray that you'd be present with us. As we consider this story of Noah, this covenant that you made, as we think about what this may mean yet for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last night I asked members of my family a simple question. What is something that is boring but still has value when you get to the end of it? Something that is boring but still has value when you get to the end of it. Elon was pretty emphatic that the answer is school. <laughs> boring but has value when you get to the end of it. Beth suggested that for her, maybe that's classical music or opera. Maggie said it was little kids' shows because they're boring to watch, but they have really good values in them. And Josiah said that some of, it, uh, some of the types of food count, like celery. It tastes like water, but it's a vegetable. So there's value in it, even though it's boring. What, what would you think of? What are things that you think of that are boring, but at the end of it have value? Any ideas? Cleaning. Cleaning? Okay. Others? Leviticus. <laughs> Leviticus. We'll get to that. Others? Uh, exercise. Exercise. Okay. Those are some examples. When I was thinking about this, I actually thought back to uh, my days of being on summer staff at Camp Friedenswald during college. Before we would start the summer, when the kids would be there, we'd have to have about a week or so of training. And it was quite a bit of talking through policies and procedures. And I think a lot of us kind of felt like, well, let's get back to the, uh, the team building exercises. And let's get back to the recreation stuff that we're not going to get to do once the kids come because we'll be too busy with the kids. And one of the things that we had to do while we were there that was very good, but also was a little boring in the way it was presented at least, was the uh, first aid training that we went through. It included CPR, it included how to do the Heimlich maneuver, and we got it down and it was fine. But, you know, I really was having a hard time seeing if I was going to really need it during the time that I was there. Nothing's going to happen, right? And to be honest, nothing did happen during that summer when I was there. But later in life, when Maggie was about two years old, she had a lifesaver. One of those little candies, heart candies, and it got lodged in her throat. And it was then that that learning that had been boring at the time became very meaningful and helpful because I was able to uh, administer the Heimlich Maneuver to a child to free up that lifesaver and to make it so that she could breathe again. It was boring at the time, but it had value later. And I think that applies also, as Kim suggested to us, for us as we're reading through this Bible in a year, the book of Leviticus. Not that reading Leviticus will someday save your life. I'm not saying that. But that in reading through it, there may be some greater value to it, even though it's boring or difficult to go through. Because I think, check me on this, but I think the majority of us would say that Leviticus is not our favorite book of the Bible. We don't really enjoy reading through it. It's not the one that makes us go, all right, I get to read that one again. Or when I get to it, I'm all jazzed up to go through that. It's a lot of boring, dry, legal, sacrifice, skin diseases and how to treat them. It's kind of tough to wade through it, isn't it? Thankfully, in our Bible reading plan, it's only about 11 days. So if you can power through it, we can get to the other side and it'll get better, right? In fact, Beth mentioned to me that she hasn't actually read through the whole Bible cover to cover before. And one of the main reasons is because of the book of Leviticus. She's read lots of the New Testament. She's read lots of the Old Testament. But every time she would try and read through the Bible cover to cover, she'd get to Leviticus and never make it to the other side. This is the time, right? And maybe this time. I think that's true of many of us, that we struggle with that. And yet, as I was reading through it this week, I was noticing some things there that I think are valuable and are good for us to engage with. First of all, I think it's interesting that and there are a number of places in there that Jesus actually quotes the book of Leviticus. You'll remember that Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, but I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. Well, that eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing comes from Leviticus 24, verse 20. 
Jesus was quoting that and then reinterpreting it. And when he is saying that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, but a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus 19.18. Again, Jesus was quoting it. Now, I have to wonder if Leviticus was important enough for Jesus to quote. Perhaps there's something there that we shouldn't be too quick to dismiss what it may have to say to us yet today. It also occurred to me as we were reading through that, that reading Leviticus helps to give us some perspective. Many of us, none of us, have lived under the law as it is in Leviticus. We don't have a perspective of what that was like. Yet when we read in the New Testament, when we read the letters of Paul, and he refers back to the law and the fact that now we're under a different covenant, under the covenant of grace, we have a hard time relating to what he had been experiencing in his life. What other people around him reading that, those letters would have experienced. But as we read through Levit Leviticus, I think a number of us could say, wow, I'm glad that's not what we're doing anymore. I'm glad that's not the covenant that we're under anymore. We're under a different covenant. And reading through the previous covenant, the law, helps to give us some perspective as to the depth and the power of what the saving love of Jesus Christ and the grace that he brings in the new covenant provide for us. And I also noted that most, if not all, of the law in the book of Leviticus, the covenant that's present there, is a covenant that there's two sides to, aren't there? God promises his part. He will do what he says he'll do, but we also have our part that we have to live out. And if we don't, there's consequences for that, right? There are things that will go wrong, or, or God will remove his protection. We have to do our part. But our covenant for this morning in Genesis is very different, isn't it? We'll remember from our reading of Genesis 6 that it was a time in the world in which God was really starting to get upset and disappointed with people. They weren't living up to the expectations that he had for them. They weren't living out the way that they were supposed to. They were making really bad choices. They were being violent. They weren't living the way that God wanted them to live. And so God made what I'm sure was a difficult choice to destroy the whole world with a flood except for Noah and his family. Because Noah was righteous and upright. And so he told Noah to build this ark, to gather these animals, to gather this food, to get that onto the ark, to take him and his family onto the ark, and then it began to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. A flood that raised up higher than the highest mountain. A flood that lasted some 150 days before it started to recede and took a long time to receive. When Noah got onto the ark, he was 600 years old. When he got off, he was 601. It was probably somewhere around a year's time that that took. But when he got off, he built an altar. And on that altar, he sacrificed to God. And when God smelled that aroma of that sacrifice, he said to himself in his heart, I will never destroy the whole world again with a flood. And he said to Noah, I am covenanting with you today, with you and all your descendants and all the animals of the earth, the whole world, that I will never destroy the whole world again with a flood. And every time that the rainbow appears in the sky, I will remember this covenant that I have made for you, with you, for all time, for all generations. Now that's a very different covenant than what we read in Leviticus, isn't it? This is a very one-sided covenant. God promises to do this regardless of what humanity does. Regardless of how many times we fail or we stumble, that we don't get it right, God has made this promise 
that God will never destroy the whole world again with the flood. It's a very one-sided co covenant, one that God will keep regardless of what we do. It's also a covenant that is different and that includes the whole world and everything in it. We read of other covenants in the Old Testament which God made with a person like Abraham and his descendants, a particular group of people, and yet this covenant is so vast and extensive that it's for every human being of all time and for all of God's creation. And it's a covenant that God offers the sign of the rainbow. Isn't it interesting, though, that so many times we think of the rainbow as a reminder to us of God's covenant, when God is very clear that it's a reminder to God? Now, I don't think that's to say that God is the forgetful one. Obviously, we are the forgetful ones. But I think it is to say that it's a reminder of what has happened, as like reminiscing or enjoying this memory of this promise that was made. That when God sees that, he remembers that he has made this promise not to flood the whole world again. And so in this covenant, God turned things upside down and inside out. God took what was a tremendous act of judgment in the flood and turned it into an expression of God's ongoing grace. It was the beginning of God's ongoing plan of redemption for humanity. It acknowledged that we will always need grace just one more time in our lives. This reality, of course, becomes most fully expressed, most fully realized and tangible in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 3, 18-22, we read, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous or the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience. For God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. In the post-flood covenant, God began to turn things upside down and inside out. God began a direction of offering grace and forgiveness. And this became most fully realized and fulfilled in Jesus Christ and his resurrection became most fully realized in that new covenant. So we see in the midst of Leviticus and this covenant and others in the Old Testament that we serve a covenant God. He made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He made a covenant with Noah. He made the covenant with the people of Israel out at Sinai. That's part of what Leviticus is. He made a covenant with David. God is a covenant God who maintains his end of the bargain, who holds that up and lives it out. But what does this mean for us in our modern context to understand our God as a covenant God? Well, it seems to me that at the very least... It means that we need to be intentional about understanding what are the covenants that we're a part of. What type of covenant is it? The covenant with Noah, with all the people, is very one-sided. It's God does his part regardless of what we do. Whereas the covenant in Leviticus is much more of a contract in which there's give and take, and both sides need to maintain their end of the agreement. It's interesting to me that for many of us, when we talk about the book of Leviticus, we pretty readily set that aside. That's not really relevant anymore. It doesn't really speak to us. It doesn't really connect with our modern context. We feel very comfortable and happy and grateful that we are under the covenant of Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection. 
through the, the grace and the love that comes with that. That is, and check me on this, unless or until it comes to a time that the covenant was broken with. When we are the ones who have upheld our end of the agreement, but it's someone else who has broken covenant with us. When covenant is broken with us, aren't we much quicker to refer back more to a covenant like that of the law of Leviticus? In which when something is done wrong to us, there needs to be some type of retribution or punishment. Now that's not to say that there isn't right and wrong. Obviously, there still is right and wrong. And it's not to say that something bad hasn't happened, because something bad has happened. But the question becomes to me, what is the type of covenant that we are under? Which type of covenant are we living out? So to get really practical about this and to explore this with you this morning, I can't help but think of the situation with Mountain States. Many of us, me included, would say that in that situation, by licensing Theta Good, Mountain States has broken covenant with us. They've gone against the agreements that we have shared together about our confession of faith and how we live out together as believers. And I would agree with that. They have broken covenant. But I also wonder which part of the covenant or which covenant are we living under? Are we living under the covenant of the Levitical Code? Are we living under the covenant of Jesus Christ? Because in times like that, it's interesting how quickly we revert back to the Levitical Code. Well, it says right there, and it does, it says that. It says right there. And they've broken covenant. And we're referring back to Leviticus, for instance. And yet when we come to our Bible reading and engaging with that book, we tend to say it's outdated and irrelevant and doesn't connect. Until it's a time when it feels like it serves what we believe to be the proper purposes. One of the ways this plays out for me in trying to understand all of this is that some of you have been reading in the Mennonite press about how there have been some churches in Ohio Conference that have chosen to leave Ohio Conference in the last number of months. And asking good questions about what that means and why it's happening. And I don't claim to have a full understanding of all that goes into those decisions to leave Ohio Conference. Um, I'm sure there's a lot that goes into that. But it seems to me that part of the decision to do so is based mostly on mountain states made their decision to do what they decide to do, and so we need to leave Ohio Conference. Even though Ohio Conference hasn't done anything to break covenant. And if you've been reading the Evangel of late, has made pretty clear statements that we have no intention to break covenant with one another. So what does that look like? I, I've tried to think about how to frame that in a way to explain how that feels a bit disconnected for me, which I don't quite understand what all goes into that decision. And no analogy is perfect, but the way that I think I understand this is it'd be similar, I think, to if a husband were to say to his wife, I need to divorce you because your cousin in Colorado did something that I don't agree with, your uncle supported it, and even though your grandpa said it was wrong, I can't be married to you anymore because I can't be a part of a family in which that is allowed. Now, that doesn't change the fact that we may disagree with what the cousin did, and that we may disagree with the support that the father gave the cousin in that decision. But it raises the question, what is the type of covenant that we are under? How do we work through those differences of opinion? We disagree about that. It's clear. But how do we relate together? How do we choose to process and move through those disagreements that we have? What is the covenant that we have with our brothers and sisters? And what does it mean for churches to leave from one conference that hasn't broken covenant because of something that's happened to the other? Now certainly, those decisions affect us 
we're connected. I'm not minimizing that at all. I'm just raising the question about covenant and what it means for us to be in relations with one another, how we work through those times, how we find those times of difficulty and what we do with them. I know that some are hopeful that as we gather for Ohio Conference in March or as we gather in Kansas City in July, that this will be a time in which the Holy Spirit moves and brings about understanding and, and reconciliation in these troubled waters. And, and I really hope that that can happen. But I also struggle a little bit when we're too quick, in my opinion, to say that we need to part ways as brothers and sisters together when we may agree with each other, but we disagree with people out there. What does it mean for us to be in shared covenant? We serve a God who judges our wrongdoing, but also abounds in grace and forgiveness. God did not need to make that one-sided covenant in Genesis about the flood. God could have chosen to leave that option open, that if he needed to, to flood the world again. But he didn't. God could have left us under the death sentence of Leviticus, of that legal code and that covenant. But God didn't. Instead, God has gone above and beyond what we deserve to offer us unwarranted grace and the opportunity for salvation. We serve a feeling God who was touched by the efforts to reach out and honor him and praise him by Noah. It began, the covenant to not flood the world again began with Noah's action and God saying to himself in his heart that he would never do that again. Noah's actions affected God's heart. It's not that we're saved by our actions, but it is that we serve a compassionate and caring God who is affected by our love of God as a parent would be affected by the love of our child. As we enter into the season of Lent, of our journey towards Palm Sunday, Passion Week, and Easter, I'd invite us to consider deeply the nature of the covenants that we are a part of. God has modeled for us a covenant of grace and forgiveness. Is there room in our hearts to extend a similar covenant to our brothers and sisters that we're in fellowship with? May we faithfully serve our covenant God of grace. May we live in ways that affect God's heart. And may the Holy Spirit guide us as we travel these turbulent waters.